Hey musicians, it's Aaron, and I'd like to do another walkthrough video today. Uh, following up on the previous video that I posted about uh, switching patches gracefully in Ableton Live. I've had a lot of feedback from that, and it seems like it's working well. Uh, it's, it's a good method for changing patches or managing uh, virtual instruments when you're playing live. But the follow-up question is always, how do you play with tracks? How do you incorporate tracks in a setup like this when you're in session view working with a whole bunch of clips. So I thought I'd show you my process for creating tracks, uh, editing them, getting them converted into clips, and then organizing them in my live set for use when I am actually playing. So just to put a little context for my entire process, I am a lead keyboard player and I run all tracks. So I've got both virtual instruments going and tracks. So whatever method I use, it needs to be flexible. I need to stay in control of those tracks. If we need to repeat a section or jump ahead, cut it out, make some other variation on the fly. All the while, I still need to play with whatever live sounds I have set up for each song. So let me jump right in. I've got a track pulled up that I purchased from multitracks.com. But whether you purchase it there or from Loop Community or any other place or whether you make your own track, uh, it's all going to be about the same process. Just make sure that you are working with uh, final bounced WAV files and that most of your editing is done ahead of time. If you need to, you can do some editing at this point as far as copying and pasting measures if you need to fix timing or whatever. But try uh, to get all your production done ahead of time. And this is where my process for um, integrating tracks starts. I'll first want to make sure I have locators set for each of these sections of the song. And you can see this one that I got from Multitracks has locators set for each section already. But if it didn't, I would just listen to the track and uh, zoom in as far as I need to be able to see a, a measure number uh, and a bar line and create uh, whatever locators I need. Uh, you can go ahead and rename those, move them around, and uh, set up your locators to whatever the minimum uh, or the lowest common denominator would be for how much control you need. For instance, if you if a song is broken into eight bar phrases, you could probably have a locator every eight bars. If it was a very standard, straightforward worship song, if it has any sections where there's an extra bar at the end, an extra measure, or uh, a shortened turnaround or anything like that, you'd want to make sure you have each one of those areas as a separate scene. That way you can have full control if you're playing live. So the next step is to slice all of these sections up into individual clips. Now let me switch over to session view because I've already done that here and I'm going to show you how I get to this point. So uh, let me just remove these scenes really quickly and I'll show you how to start from scratch. So back here in arrangement view I'm going to go through and select all of the areas between each locator and go up to create and consolidate time to new scene. You'll see it fly through there, and it took that selection and consolidated those into individual clips over in session view. So we're going to continue through each song section, uh, just selecting and consolidating that time to a new scene. And I'll do just a handful here so we can get at least an idea of where we're going. Maybe we'll get up to this chorus and call that good. Uh, one quick note, as you are creating your tracks, it's helpful to use somewhat of a templated approach, meaning you know, always try to drop in some sort of guide, uh, some sort of click track if you're not using the built-in metronome of Ableton. And um, I'll show you why in just a little bit. But now that we've got those sliced up, let's go ahead and look over here at session view. And we can see each each selection that I made now shows up as a different scene. And if we look at the guide uh, for this very first clip, I can see it's two bars long, and I know that that is my Countin. So I'm just going to rename this clip Countin. Um, actually, I am going to also set the BPM. 
and the division that I want. And I usually run my tracks in 8.8, 8, so I have a little more, um, I have more accents, more divisions on the click track that we're running. And so here I know I've got intro, and then we've got verse, pre-chorus, and chorus. All right, that's good for now. Um, let me go ahead and switch over to my live set, and we'll pick up there as I get ready to import these clips into my live set. Very similar to uh, the one that I demonstrated in my previous video, because uh, it's all based off of that method. I've got all my uh, blank MIDI clips for controlling my various chain selectors. And uh, the way I have my uh, my live set structure is I have all my control channels over here. I've got all my virtual instrument channels over here. You can see I'm, I've got a couple contact instances. Um, right now I have two Omnisphere instances. Sometimes I have more depending on the number of tracks. Then I've also got master output channels that everything is subgrouped through. And then over here is where I keep all of my tracks. I've got a group for each uh, set of tracks, uh, channels related to each track, and I'm going to show you how to import those right now. So let me go ahead and browse out to my Ableton folder where I keep my tracks. And we were looking at Wake Up. And if I expand down here, we can see a list of all the channels in that in that live set. Um, I'm going to import just the ones I need. I'm going to bring in that guide. I'm going to bring in the parts that I am not playing live or can't play live, uh, which is just going to be this handful of tracks. And then I'm going to drag those over into my live set, being careful that when I get over here, I drop it on the very edge so that it creates those tracks um, each individually. And then just for organization, I'm going to group those tracks. Uh, here I've got a group. I'm just going to rename that and call that Wake Up. And then here are all of the tracks that we've got there. Uh, actually, I did not get the guide track uh, placed in, but that's okay because uh, I do something different with my guide track. I have a separate guide channel where I put all of my guides and I'll show you why in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and create a whole bunch of blank scenes so that I can rearrange these clips as needed. Um, so let me pause this recording and I'll be back in just a second. As you can see here, I've created a whole bunch of new scenes uh, for each of these song sections. And then I've, I've moved all these clips down so that they correspond with the scenes. It might look like a lot of clips, but that's really the best way that I've found to get complete control. So let's look at this guide track that I've got here. I've got you know it labeled for each of the song sections, and I am going to drag this over to my common guide track just because I maintain one channel where I keep all my guides. That way I can see all the song sections um, right away. Now, I don't need this channel anymore, so I'm going to delete that. And then let me show you a real quick uh, shortcut that I found to rename these scenes appropriately. There is a Max for Live device from Isotonic Studios, and it's got this really basic name called Clip to Scene. And basically, you drop that on a channel, and you click this fantastic little rename button. And if you watch all these scenes over here, you'll notice that, boom, they're instantly renamed to match whatever channel I, I threw that, uh, that device on. So I, I primarily use that on my guide track, since I keep my guides named for each song section. And then with one click, I can just rename all those scenes and they match perfectly. So we're done with that, good to go. And you'll also notice that over here on my, uh, on my grouping here, I can route it 
my entire track to one of my outputs. Uh, right now, I usually run most of my tracks through one. Or if you need to separate them out, you can change individual outputs for each of the um, individual tracks as well. Quantize settings for the entire project. And you may notice that I've got my global quantize set to none. That's because when I am using MIDI control clips, I want those changes to happen right away. I don't want to have to wait till the next downbeat for that clip to activate. We also don't use the click all the time. If we come to the end of a song or a spontaneous moment uh, and we vary from the click, we'll, we'll usually turn the click off so that it, we're not forced to stay on the beat. Um, so I usually keep my Ableton clock running the entire time and I've got uh, my uh, metronome control map to a button on my control surface so I can just turn on the master click uh, at any given point. I don't usually run with clicks embedded in tracks. Um, if you prefer to run that way, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, I've got my global quantize set to none so that any of those changes happen right away. And then I will set all of my tracks to quantize uh, to one bar. So let me go ahead and select all these individual clips. And down here in the Explorer, I can set this quantize value to one bar. And that's what we want. The only exception is this very first scene uh, to start the song. I'm going to select those clips. I am going to set that quantized value to none as well. And the reason being is that if I have my um, Ableton clock running the entire time, like I usually do, if I fire off a scene and all of the clips in that scene um, have no quantized settings or it's set to none, that firing off that scene will reset the bar counter back to one and it'll pick up right there. So as I mentioned, I've got my metronome on off mapped to a hardware button and I also have the fire selected scene MIDI command mapped to a button as well. So anytime I fire off a new song or a new set of, um, sorry, let me stop that clip here. Uh, any a set of new clips, I usually follow two keystrokes. The first one is to turn the metronome on. The second one is to fire the selected scene. So when you fire both those keystrokes or those uh, two buttons next to each other in you know a very fast consecutive order, the effect is that the metronome comes on, and then the very next button starts the next uh, set of scenes off at the one measure and it works flawlessly. Let me show you what I mean here. If you watch this uh, bar counter up here you'll notice that it is going and as soon as I hit the metronome button and fire current scene you'll see uh, these tracks fire off here. And it's right on the one count. Uh, the bar resets to the first one. And I'm going to stop this, and we'll pick up in just a second. Various scene advancement methods here. If you've used Ableton, I'm going to assume you have a, a minimum a set of knowledge about Ableton. You can use Ableton's built-in follow actions. If you select a clip uh, down here in the Explorer, you can set a follow action, which would probably be next but the downside is that you have to set the number of bars after which that action takes place. So for instance, you'd have to do this scene by scene, select the first scene, I happen to know these clips are all two bars long, and then we'd have to set those follow actions to two bars, and then next. And then the intro is four bars long, I'd have to do the same thing, select the entire scene, set that to four bars uh, with the action to next. So that takes a lot more time uh, to edit. So I'm just going to undo this because I don't ever use those. The next method, if you've seen any videos or other tutorials online, Ian McIntosh uses the IAC driver or some other MIDI loopback driver 
to create a second MIDI control channel that you can use to fire off different scenes, advanced, next, and previous, or whatever. For how I run tracks, that's a little bit uh, cumbersome as well. If you already have that set up to manage things, uh, great. Go ahead and use that method for advancing scenes. But the easiest way that I've found is with another Max for Live device from Isotonic Studios as well. And this one is called Follow. A follow device I drop on my guide channel. And that's why I keep all my guides separate here, because the way the follow device works is that it watches a clip, and at the end of that clip, it'll fire off an action. So uh, as you see, I've got it configured here. It's watching for two beats before the end of the clip, and then it's going to fire off this action on this item. So uh, two bar... or two counts before the end of each clip is going to fire off the next scene. So if I fire off this first scene, and remember it's only two bars long, we'll see it fire off. Here's the second bar, and on the third count it's going to fire the next scene, and go ahead and start that. And this scene I happen to know is four bars, so we're just coming up on it here, and then it fires off the next one. And because it's triggering entire scenes, I don't have to worry about individual clips or anything like that, as long as the quantize settings are set to one bar. And my follow device on my guide channel is set uh, to whatever action I want. It's going to advance all the way through these scenes exactly as they are laid out in scenes. So let me go ahead and stop this. Um, this is fantastic because you can arrange your scenes during rehearsal and come up with an estimated or a planned structure and then I, and I'll show you in just a few minutes how to deal with uh, variations to that. So for instance if we need to double up the intro I can simply duplicate that scene and as it advances through that intro will be doubled up. If we get down to a bridge and I want to double that up as well Again, just duplicate the scene, it duplicates the clips, and you're golden. Your follow device on the guide channel will keep you advancing through all of those uh, consecutively. Now the follow device also has a feature, it, they call it a foot switch control, and basically this is a MIDI mappable button that will toggle the follow device to a secondary action. I have this mapped to a button on my control surface, not necessarily a foot controller, but you can see when this this button is engaged, the action changes from next to again. So that means the follow device is going to trigger the same scene two bars before the end, or I'm sorry, two counts before the end of the scene. So if I would use this if we got to a chorus and we wanted to double it up and extend it again. You know, say the leader looked back and said, let's repeat this, you know, keep going. And I did not have that scene doubled up. I would go ahead and engage this button, which changes the follow device to the again action, and it just repeats the current scene. And then any time before the end of that section, I just need to turn this off or whatever. So let's say we repeated a section and we want to jump ahead a few areas. I have the next scene, previous scene buttons mapped to my controller as well. So if we are up here in the intro, I'm going to fire that one off again. And then let's say we want to go to that verse early, I can manually advance and cue that scene. So let's say we want to jump from this chorus. You can see the chorus just comes in there. And for whatever reason, just for example purposes, I'm going to jump straight ahead to the instrumental. And I am just manually advancing next scene, previous scene, and then I have the button that I mentioned before right beside the metronome of fire the selected scene. So with four buttons and the follow device, the Max for Live device, 
I have everything nearly automated, um, provided that we do it exactly the same as rehearsal, but if anything comes up during a service and I need to improvise on the fly, I can just go next or previous and fire the selected scene, or for whatever reason, if we need to come out completely, I ha since I have all my tracks and everything subgrouped, I'll just pull down my slider that I have mapped to my uh, track channel just to pull the track volume completely out. That'll keep the metronome going so that we can continue to stay on beat and on measure if we are going into a spontaneous moment. But if for whatever reason we need to click out completely, I'll just go ahead and use my button that I have mapped to the metronome control to turn that off as well. So this whole time I would be playing live as well uh, with recording this video there's too much of a delay to be able to play to tracks and stay on tempo but you get the idea um, I would have my live instruments set up whether it be a pad piano whatever and then these tracks are just are augmenting everything that I'm playing live so it, since everything is organized by scene if I wanted to drag one of my MIDI control clips down here so that I turn off my pad and turn on my piano at the beginning of that song, I can do that there. So as soon as I fire off the scene, it's going to set up my sounds, and it's also going to trigger all of the tracks over here. Let's say I get down to an instrumental and I want to bring in yet another virtual instrument. I can just create a MIDI clip controlling whatever instrument I have down there. Um, makes it really flexible. You can automate a lot of things. You can automate your uh, patch changes, sound changes, as long as they correspond to one of these areas as well. Anyway, that's a quick run through of my process for creating tracks. I hope that's been helpful. Feel free to post a comment if you have any questions or send me a message on Facebook or Twitter. I'd be more than happy to see if there's anything I can help you with and hope that everything is working well for you in your live sets and especially in your services. Uh, thanks, and we'll talk to you later.